And speaking of knowledge, let's get counting. Number 10, Marvel's Lifeline. One of the best things about the Ultimate line was what it did for Marvel as a company and a publisher. It provided a lifeline to Marvel at a time when it needed it the most. The comics industry bubble that once had made collectibles so valuable had burst. The hype and demand of the early 90s had vanished completely, leaving Marvel with tons of comics printed that would simply not sell. With the demand gone and production costs putting them into the red, Marvel was forced to sell off licenses to some of their best characters. This is how Sony got the rights to Spider-Man and how Fox got the rights to X-Men, and it's what prompted Marvel to change things up and create the Ultimate Universe. The Ultimate Universe was meant to be something fresh and new, free of continuity and ultimately more gritty, realistic, and with an edge. Amazingly, the new line of Ultimate Comics did well, so well that it provided Marvel with the stability it needed to recover. Without the Ultimate line, it's possible that we might not have the Marvel stories, animated series, films, or comics of today. That's how successful and important Ultimates was. Number 9, The Inhumans. I've said it before and I will say it again, I think the design of The Inhumans is much better on Earth 1610. They look more compelling and intimidating. Nothing against the 616 Inhumans, who I also like just fine, but I actually want to get to know these Inhumans more. Overall, I think the Ultimate Inhumans are a little more interesting than their main continuity counterparts. Number 8, No Previous Continuity. One of the best things that the Ultimate Universe and line offered readers was a fresh start, meaning that years and years of comic book history didn't really apply here. The idea was you didn't have to know what had gone on in the past or what was going on currently in the comics to just jump into a book, with comic book continuity being a concept that many new readers still find daunting today. This was freeing for consumers because it meant you could buy in without having to worry about potentially being confused because something from 20 years prior came up that you needed to understand in order to know what was really going on in the story. This wasn't the case for Earth 1610. At least, it wasn't the case to begin with. Freedom from continuity meant more creative freedom for writers, but unfortunately, Ultimates really only started as new reader accessible, but quickly became bogged down with intricate storytelling and details. It even ended up having retcons as well, which might confuse readers jumping in later on, with the first Ultimate Iron Man series being so out there that Marvel decided to retcon it out of existence, instead turning it into a ridiculous anime show set in the same universe, but that wasn't actually considered to be the true story of Iron Man. So that comic basically became like non-canon. Number seven, Sue and Reed splits. Finally, this reality is one where Sue seems to be more aware that Reed can never really fully commit to her. He proposes right before Ultimatum goes down and they are faced with a giant wave as a result. Sue manages to push the wave back but slips into a comatose state as a result, prompting Reed to go out looking to punish the villains and abandoning Sue, leaving her with the Thing aka Ben Grimm. In the Ultimate Universe, Reed and Sue actually don't end up together in the end. In fact, Sue, after she is revived, finds out about a sinister plot of Reed's, realizing that he has become a villain. Ben attempts to try and explain how Reed could just be up to something that they both don't fully understand, but Sue is over making any more excuses for him, implying that she never wanted to marry him to begin with. In fact, Sue and Ben actually end up together with Reed becoming a villain. For some reason, I actually find this to be just a better fit for these two characters, just in terms of their overall paths. As much as they've had some pretty sweet moments together on Earth 616, the couple has also had major problems over the years that sometimes seem just to get swept under the rug so that we can, like, try to keep them together without any resolution of those problems. This, however, provides us with some resolution and consequence for those moments. And it kind of addresses some of them, which I like. Just feels... Just feels a little more realistic. Number six, Nick Fury. Another great thing that the Ultimate Universe gave us was a new Nick Fury that was so successful, he actually became the new version of Nick Fury in the main continuity and inspired the MCU version of the character as well. Hilariously enough, Samuel L. Jackson's likeness inspired the redesign of the character. Fury would even acknowledge that Jackson would be his top pick to play him in a movie. The story goes that originally Samuel L. Jackson was actually not too happy about Marvel using his likeness without really asking him or without any compensation or conversation about it, but when he contacted them, they actually apologized and offered him the role of Nick Fury in any future films. Jackson supposedly was appeased and accepted the offer. And the rest, they say, is history. Today, I personally cannot imagine the MCU without him. Number five, death. 
Wait a minute, Amanda, didn't you just cite death as being a bad thing on your worst list? Yes, yes, I did. We were talking about Ultimatum. But that was more death for the sake of death, not death in general. I actually enjoy when characters die. Well, I don't enjoy when they die, but more that I enjoy the finality that death invites. I like death as consequences, but more than that, I like the higher stakes that it gives us. If anyone at any point can die, it means that everything is more exciting because, you know, they might not make it back from that mission. Their actions carry more weight because there's a real risk that they face. When characters can die, it also means stories get to end, and with endings come new and exciting beginnings. Number four, The Maker. Talk about unique spins on characters, the maker definitely offered us a completely different take on Reed Richards. One that was more modern and actually felt like it kind of fit better, <laughs> not just within the world, but within a more current day and age. I think a huge issue with the Fantastic Four that we see when it comes to adapting that team to sort of a film setting in the modern day is that the heroes are are kind of stiff. They're definitely a product of the time period in which they were created, a perfect and kind of wholesome family unit. The Ultimate Universe shattered that expectation, broke up the Fantastic Four team, and gave us the amazing villain that is the Maker, a version of Reed Richards whose love and dedication to science actually makes him a horrifying, immoral, pretty much mad scientist type. If a mad scientist could somehow also be like disturbingly sane and logical. The Maker is one of the best villains to have ever existed in comics in general, not even just within the confines of the Ultimate Universe, which of course the Maker would also literally break free from in the comics. Number three, Ultimate Spider-Man. Although there were many problems when it came to the continuity of the Ultimate Universe, the Spider-Man series was not one of them. In fact, Ultimate Spider-Man was more celebrated for being a breath of fresh air that remained consistently coherent throughout. To this day, it remains some fans' favorite Spider-Man comic series, period, and not just one of their favorite series within the Ultimate Universe. Some even hold this series above any of the Spider-Man main continuity stuff. Why was the Spider-Man series so good from Ultimates? It had a sense of finality, and it wasn't wishy-washy. It committed, it followed through, it offered fresh new takes on characters, and whether or not you loved all of those new takes, you had to respect them. Most of those changes were made to make Spider-Man's stories and characters feel more grounded, more realistic. Peter also returned to high school, which a lot of fans enjoyed because they felt it was younger Peter, Spider-Man in high school, that was kind of his most relatable version. So taking him back there, felt really good. Number two, Miles Morales. One of the greatest things to come out of Ultimate Spider-Man as well, the story and character of Miles Morales, whom we've all come to love very dearly. What's more, Peter's apparent death also paved the way for Miles, allowing him to step into the spotlight as Spider-Man, and even take over. Even after we learned that Peter Parker had actually survived as well and wasn't actually dead due to the Oz formula making him virtually immortal, he still decided to pass the torch to Miles. He'd had his time as a hero, now it was Miles' turn. I just love how the story goes. I love that Miles truly got to be the one and only Spider-Man on Earth-1610. And while I love Peter, I kind of hope we get to see Miles step into the spotlight as the one and only Spider-Man at some point on Earth-616 too. Or bring back a world where he is the one and only Spider-Man. Number one, the MCU. The ultimate line is what helped to pave the way for the MCU, and in fact provided much needed inspiration for the cinematic universe. There are many characters from Earth 1610 who have influenced their Earth 199999 counterparts, that is, their Marvel Cinematic Universe counterparts. Not only have characters from the Ultimate Universe found their way to the big screen through the MCU, but stories from the Ultimate line have also served to inspire some of those told to us in the films. Number 10, Hawkeye. Ultimate Hawkeye first appeared in Ultimate Issue 7, and he doesn't mind going for the kill this time around. He was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who wasn't as fancy when it came to arrows, he's just more military this time around. It's actually pretty dark at times. He became a super soldier once briefly when the Avengers were put on the USS Jimmy Carter. They got captured, and then Hawkeye and a few others ingested super soldier serum and then they rescued Nick Fury. Hawkeye is a pretty sweet agent, he's badass, he gets it done but his family life and dynamic with Black Widow this time around is much different than most would think. When a team of mercenaries broke into Clint's house early on, they took out his wife and kids, which is awful, but it gets even worse when you find out that Black Widow was the leader of said mercenary team. 
And then Hawkeye gets even in a pretty gruesome way. Three arrows, perfectly placed. Gory, pretty gory, very gory. Number nine, Nick Fury. When he entered the Ultimate and Marvel team up issue five, Nick Fury would soon take over as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. And his first plan was to bring back the Super Soldier program, which actually resulted in the creation of Ultimate Captain America and Ultimate Hulk, etc. His origins are pretty unique. I mean, he fought for the US in World War II, and tragically, he was taken by force to be the next test subject for Project Rebirth. When he was injected with this new serum, it gave him super strength, and in turn, he freed himself and other prisoners and busted out of there. So now he's got quite the power behind those punches, and Ultimate Nick Fury is way cooler than our 616 Nick Fury because he was designed to look like Samuel L. Jackson, so it's really no contest. And before we continue on with this list of ultimate heroes, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does help our channel out a lot. I'm not gonna waste any more of your time. Let's go right back into this list. Thank you so much. Number eight, Nightcrawler. Kurt Wagner made his ultimate debut in Ultimate X-Men issue seven. Now his origins here had him growing up in the Weapon X program and he was trained to become an assassin from the start. He had a pretty dark upbringing and in turn he would have these bad pockets with the X-Men. Like Warren and Dazzler were a couple, but Kurt also liked Dazzler, so he kidnapped her? Okay. And the team was like, hey, uh, so we're gonna put you in a coma now because that's not cool. We can't really do that. And then he came back and he apologized. The dust was settled, no hard feelings. Okay, sure. He joined Colossus' X-Men team with Dazzler and Angel, by the way, so it was definitely fine. Kurt wasn't all bad. He was actually kind of funny, I mean, as a character, because sometimes he would use the danger room with Angel to reenact Pirates of the Caribbean instead of, you know, fighting bad guys. So already this version is my kind of guy. I mean, minus the kidnapping part, of course. Him and Angel were tight because they couldn't hide their mutations, so they ended up being best of friends. So they fought pirates together, chased the same girls, they're living the mutant dream in a way. Not bad. Sadly, Kurt was killed by Magneto's ultimatum wave, and it got a lot of other X-Men killed as well. So it's dark, it's nice, and then it's dark. That's the ultimates. Number seven, the Hulk. First appearing in Ultimate Marvel Team Up issue two, he's still big, he's still angry, but this time around he is gray. Okay. Now before this, however, Bruce Banner wanted to be just like Captain America, back before he was the Hulk, back before he was big and strong. So at Cambridge University, he was committed to duplicating the super soldier serum with helps of Nick Fury's super soldier blood. So he used it on himself, and honestly, already I'm a fan of Bruce Banner more. I mean, the Hulk hasn't even been created yet. And then Nick Fury, the first super soldier, gathered the best genetic engineers to recreate the serum, and Bruce was luckily amongst them. So Bruce actually thought that he figured this thing out, but again, he wanted to be like Cap and he wanted to stay quiet. So he tested this new serum out on himself and then he ended up becoming Ultimate Hulk. Later on, Bruce decided to make even more serum. So he mixed Super Soldier serum again with this new Hulk serum, smashed them together, injected himself. So now Super Soldier Nick Fury actually made Banner the Hulk in this timeline. That's a cool sentence right there. Number six. Deadpool. Meet Wade e. Wilson. He had a pretty rough go in the Ultimates, as do most of them. I'd say more intense than his 616 counterpart, because in Ultimate Spider-Man, Wilson gets hired by the Genosian government, but of course in Deadpool spirit, he gets hired to double down and hunt these mutants, but it's also a TV event. It's fun. And then when Deadpool is going up against Spider-Man, he actually gets unmasked. And his appearance is even more shocking in this reality. Even the host has to apologize to the viewers at home, because his mask, I mean, to begin with, wasn't even really a mask, it's translucent, so not really the best. And then Spider-Man even adds insult to injury, saying that his face smells like a KFC dumpster on a hot day. So if anybody needs redemption, it's definitely Wadey Wilson from the Ultimates. Number five, Juggernaut. The first time we see him, it's very clear that he's more powerful. Something is up with this X-Men. He looked like a future version of the Juggernaut. It was pretty intimidating. Now he looks like an evil stripper from the future, which is, Honestly, I like it, it's cool. He was a genius in this universe as well. I mean, literally, the guy was super smart. He grew up in the same trailer park as Rogue and he still considered himself trailer trash, although he was one of the smartest people alive. Guys, never doubt yourself. Things took a turn when he was taken by Weapon X and forced to be this living weapon of mass destruction, then following the orders of Colonel John Wraith, he was part of their strike force that took out the X-Men, or even worse, forced the X-Men into Weapon X which we heard plenty of early on in this list. He walked tall and mighty until he got taken out in the dumbest way possible. Like the juggernaut, ah, oh, this makes me upset. He for sure needs a redemption, that's all I'm saying. Even when he's fighting Rogue later on, he still wants them to be happy and in love. He still wants that dream, so he's still a good guy deep down. And then Ultimate X-Men issue 99, in the middle of a fight he gets taken down because of a poisonous 
dart. A dart. Yeah, just one of those. <laughs> That's it. The juggernaut got taken out by a dart. It went right through his visor gap. I mean, amazing aim, but come on. This is the same guy that dropped a building on Gambit? Number four, Mr. Fantastic. Reed Richards needs a redemption on screen before anything else. I mean, the last Fantastic Four movie, I mean, if you haven't watched it, honestly, don't. Marvel's redoing them soon. You might as well just wait it out. In the Ultimate version, it was dark, and he was younger, and honestly, he was cooler. He made his first appearance in Ultimate Fantastic Four issue one, and even at the start of Ultimatum, when that big wave hit, Sue bites the bullet, and he didn't waste any time. He's not happy. He immediately blames Namor, and by blaming, I mean he knocks him out first and then asks questions later. Okay, read, chill. Eventually, he becomes a villain in this universe, referring to himself as the Maker, and caused some trouble in the 616 universe as well, after his universe was destroyed. Now, this is the Mr. Fantastic that we need. This guy gets the job done. He is... He's scary. Number three, Wolverine. Making his first appearance in Ultimate X-Men issue one, he didn't remember his past and he thinks that he was once married. He has a ring and he thinks Sabretooth killed his family. It's all a blur, stressful. No thanks to Weapon X. Now, Ultimate James Howlett is actually the first mutant and it turns out that this time around, you can kill Wolverine. You just have to rip his bones out that happen to have adamantium built into it. That ought to do it. Also, so painful. This all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event, and Wolverine doesn't even have a chance to scream. The adamantium that bonded to his bones erupted outward like water bursting through a dam. There's a nice picture for you. And he's still breathing when this happens. I mean, if this isn't one of the worst things to go through, I don't know what it is. Number two, Thor. Making his first entry in the Ultimates with issue four, Thor Odinson actually looks a lot like our current MCU Thor, and I think he might have more in common than we think. For starters, the ultimate Thor needs a magic belt to have powers, and in Spider-Man Homecoming, Happy mentions Thor's magic belt and all the stuff that they're packing up on moving day. So Thor just might need this come love and thunder, but in the comics, Loki was convincing everybody that Thor is just an insane dude with a magic belt. And they kind of bought it. What happens was, he wasn't worthy yet, so he got his ass kicked, and then finally in Ultimates 2, issue 12, he gets his powers back. But the fact that this Thor went through all that to begin with, so sad, definitely so sad. Number one, Quicksilver. Okay, yeah, he's in love with his sister in the Ultimates, and it's weird, and it's gross. Yeah, sure. But this Quicksilver otherwise was far more superior. He was faster in the Ultimate Universe, he was supersonic when it comes to speeds. He almost reached the speed of light at one point, like, come on, dude. And as long as he's still alive, he can always reheal himself. In Ultimate Wolverine issue three, Pietro grabs Logan and runs with him. He was actually trying to tear the flesh off him, and if it was anybody else but Wolverine, it probably would have worked. And in Ultimate Comics 29, he heals himself using his super fast metabolism, and he uses his super speed to study Reed Richards' notes. He says he's not smart, but he is fast, so he ran the math nearly 100,000 times. That's insane. Quicksilver needs a comeback for sure, more so on screen than I think any superhero right now. Hashtag Ralph Boner. Picking off the list at number 10, Vampire King. If there's one thing we need, it's more Vampire Hulk. I mean, right? That's what you were just thinking of. Also, scariest thing you can imagine, easily. He made his first debut in Ultimate Comics Avengers issue three, and at first he was actually Nerd Hulk, which we see in the MCU right now. God, I hope he doesn't turn into a vampire. Or maybe I do, I don't know. Now, he was a clone of the Hulk that Captain America could take down. So he was smart, but he couldn't win a physical fight. So the Avengers kind of kicked him out. They're like, great, you're smart, but you can't punch, so beat it, pal. Rude. But that's when the next version of Nerd Hulk came to be. He was bitten by a vampire and took over an entire vampire horde. Now, the solution to a vampire Hulk was easier than we might have thought. Just teleport him into sunlight. And that's exactly what happened in Ultimate Avengers 18. We definitely need this guy to come back, especially now, post-COVID, he'd make a mark. Number nine, the magician. A magician, the magician. Who is he? The first Ultimate X-Men character that doesn't actually have a counterpart. So the Magician is OG in the Ultimates. Meet Elliot Boggs. He made his grand entrance at Ultimate X-Men issue 66, created by Robert Kirkman and Tom Rainey. Now, he was always dedicated to protect humanity, which is a great thing in a superhero. We want that. But when his powers came to be, the police thought that Elliot was the cause of his parents' death. Rightfully so. I mean, this guy can warp reality, but he can't even control it. So you don't really want to be around 
him, but you kind of want to be around him. He was able to create people, which is a pretty amazing ability. Dangerous, but amazing. So he worked with the X-Men for a bit, and then he worked with the Academy of Tomorrow for a bit. And then Nick Fury secretly talked to Xavier in hopes to get the magician into S.H.I.E.L.D. custody. Now the team attacked Elliot after some drama. They thought it was a threat. So he just created more villains. He just created more instances of multiple man, blob, and toad from the Brotherhood to attack. And Wolverine finished the kid off with his claws to the chestal plate, and it turns out that was just a manifestation, and Elliot was actually still alive. He just needs to disappear to work on his power. Fair. Where are you now? Is it good? Come back. I don't know. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It's really helpful for our channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for your constant support. Let's get right back into this list. Number eight, a teen mutant. This next one is a one-off. He doesn't have a name, so we're just going to refer to him as teen mutant for now. He doesn't last too long. Now at first, he looks like a regular kid. There's posters on his wall. He's got Wolverine on his wall, which is cool. He reminds me of me a little bit, you know. And the caption says, be different. So he took that advice, maybe a little bit too far. So he wakes up, he's ready for school. He's looking for breakfast and his mother is just nowhere to be seen. Only a pile of her clothes remains on the ground. So he calls the cops, just kidding. He didn't do that. He just went to school after leaving a note. Don't do this, kids. Don't do that at all. On the way there, he sees a collar on the ground, again by itself, just clothing laid on the sidewalk. What's going on? Now, finally, he sees people, so he's not going crazy, which is a relief, but I bet he wishes that he was crazy because he had this neat ability where people just don't survive being close to him. He hears it from the guy in the poster, Wolverine himself, when he finds him ducking out in a cave. So what happened was, when he hit puberty, this teen, he developed a specific mutation that radiates a series of toxins and acid-like poisons which wipes out any organic tissue and just turns it into vapor, turns it into mist. The number of the day that he ended up taking out just because he hit puberty was 265. And I thought pimples were bad. Number seven, Silver Searcher. So the name is a little different for Norrin Rad and the Ultimates. He made his first debut in Ultimate Fantastic Four, issue 42. He was teleported to Earth after Reed Richards mistook him for a star that he wanted to harness. So he brought him here. Awesome, it wasn't his fault. So naturally the world was also in chaos because of his arrival. But Norrin said that he would summon his master who would make the population of Earth happier than they've ever been. Fresh water for all, free phone plans, taxing the rich. What is this plan, sir? The searcher's master was Zenla's ruler at the time. Revka, Termaloon, Edifax, Skyros the third. Rolls off the tongue nice and easy, cool. Also known as the king without enemies. Let's just go with that. So this king would use mind control, that's the trick here, to get mind control and get these humans to worship them. So after Psycho Man took over the earth, Silver Searcher rescued Mr. Fantastic and asked him to save the planet. Now the Searcher helped the Fantastic Four afterwards and then continued wandering the depths of space. Now we'd love to see a betrayal, especially when it's for the good side, you know? Norrin is great and in the Ultimates, he is immortal and he's powerful enough to go against the Phoenix, so. Yeah, we need more of them. Number six, Loki. Making his first appearance in the Ultimates 2 issue one, Loki Odinson was much more powerful here. He has the ability to shuffle time and space, as Thor simply puts it. In the beginning, Loki would fight alongside Thor and Baldur. They were the Warriors Three. Now his mother was a prisoner of Odin and asked him to bring her the Norn Stones, but while he was stealing them, he took out his brother Baldur and of course was banished to Asgard afterwards. Now Loki can literally warp reality in the Ultimates. He can retcon history into anything he wanted to. He could create these events that just never happened until he was depowered by Odin, of course. Now, even after he was depowered, he was still able to put up quite a fight as our normal Loki. Now, I want to see more Warriors 3 with them. Like, I would watch a show with just those three any day. It's probably going to come, realistically, at this rate that Marvel's going at. Number five. Iron Man. Making his first appearance in Ultimate Marvel Team Up issue four, Ultimate Iron Man has some medical issues as well, but it's much more bizarre this time around. It's not his heart that makes him unique, it's actually his brain. Now he was born a genius of course, and he was also one of two twin boys, the other being Gregory Stark. Now Tony originally wanted to start his own business with his current girlfriend Josie Gardner, but after so much pressure from his father, he decided to join the family business, and Josie ended up leaving Tony because of this. She was like, oh, I thought we had a thing Okay, see ya. Then six months later, Josie tragically passed away in a plane crash. Now the plane crash was orchestrated by Mandarin International, which was a company that used to work with Howard Stark earlier, but cut ties. Mmm, drama. So Howard wanted Tony to put all that pain into work for the company, 
but Tony was like, you know what? I think nanotechnology is where I'm gonna put that energy. So after his father's passing, Tony then had to fully take over the company. But by then he was a troubled celebrity, he was an alcoholic, and things got even harder for Tony when he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. So he mixed his biotech with armor and he bought himself some time. Now ultimate Tony Stark's tumor was actually an infinity stone growing in his brain. So with the nanotech body and everything, it just made him stronger, so much stronger. So this gave Tony the ability to transfer his consciousness between other machines. He's actually friends with his brain tumor in this world. Uh, his name is actually Anthony, it's a little boy. It's like a separate living hallucination boy. Totally normal. Number four, Colossus. Making his first appearance in the 1610 universe with Ultimate X-Men issue one, Peter Rasputin, AKA Colossus, was discovered during the Cold War. He was attacked by Anatol Spichkin, but when it was confirmed that Peter was indeed a mutant, a deal was made instead. Anatol would keep his secret and he was so ready to give Peter a job, but down the road, if he ever needed one, he had a job for him down the road. Of course, he was a giant guy made of metal. He's like, hey, I got some for you to do, trust me. Roofing, stapling, some hammering, we can find you some things. Peter's father, like most fathers in these comics, was not a pleasant man. So Peter thought, you know what? I could use some of that help now, let's go. And then he went back to Anatol because the thing is, Ultimate Colossus had thick skin, literally he was made of steel, but he wasn't strong enough where it really made a huge difference. I mean, sure, drywall is easier to punch through, but it was heavy. Like imagine wearing a skin suit of metal. The Tin Man probably had insane caps, but it wasn't until Anatol introduced Peter to this drug called Banshee, and that's where he got the strength behind those metal mitts. So now Colossus on narcotics was taken on these jobs, these super strong tourist gigs. And at the age of 19, Peter was picked up from Big Boris, a Russian mafia boss, and then he worked with him for 10 years. So we just joined the mafia for 10 years from 19 to 29. You know, the usual, thing you do after you're 19. He kept his powers a secret mostly for those around him. And then one day during a botched arm deal, Peter and his team were shot at. Peter survived because of his thick skin and his mutant ability was also exposed in a much greater way. He was kind of screwed until Jean Grey found him and then offered him a spot with the X-Men. That's actually where you got the codename Colossus. Now this version is unreal. He's close with Wolverine as they both share, you know, horrible backgrounds. They would walk the streets at night just trying to solve these dark cases, looking for trouble. Imagine these two bumping into you, no chance. In Ultimate War, he took on Thor and Iron Man at the same time for 10 minutes. So, how wild is that? Number three, Ultimate Red Skull. Making his debut in the Ultimate Comics Avengers 1 back in 2009, Ultimate Red Skull is, I know, a villain, but he wasn't always that way. He's a lot different than the Red Skull that we know from our main continuity. He's actually the son of Steve Rogers in this universe and Gail Richards. They even hid him and trained him to become the next Captain America. The Ultimates are wild, this is the dream scenario. But he always feared that he would never live up to his father's expectations. Now, it's not like he was raised in a bad household, it was kind of the opposite. He was raised to become a superhero. He was raised to fill some rather big boots. He was raised to become the next Captain America after he was declared dead in Iceland. So he kind of had the dream job and he was more powerful than Steve Rogers as well. So what happened? So when we're talking about comebacks, I really think Ultimate Red School could have been a treat. Now he was eventually in charge of the military that he grew up with. He figured out now that he was a leader and he used it against them. His personality as well was pretty easy going so it wasn't hard to convince anybody what he was doing. But again, he had this mental wall where he could never live up to Father Rogers. So at age 17, he escaped and took out every doctor and soldier on that team. He just wiped everybody out, so evil. And then he used a kitchen knife to really complete the whole Red Skull look. A nice do-it-yourself makeover. Nice and haunting. So he had all the tools to be great, but that pressure of Steve Rogers took him down the wrong path. Interesting. Number two, Magneto. He made his first appearance in Ultimate X-Men issue one. Eric Lenscher was born to two Canadian agents of Weapon X. Now he got his abilities and mastered magnetism at a young age and his father didn't respond well to that. He was intoxicated most of the time and he attacked Eric one day. Not an ideal living situation for a child. Now he tried to shoot Eric once but those powers naturally came out and then Eric pushed the bullet right back. So Eric had to spend his teen years with that guilt weighing down on him. Now eventually he was disgusted with Weapon X, the whole idea of finding a cure for the mutant gene through means of so he used these abilities, freed Mutant X, Wolverine, who I talked about in part one of this list, which you for sure watched. And then Eric married a human woman named Isabel, but he left her once he met Charles Xavier. They didn't fall in love. He was fascinated. This is the first adult mutant that he's ever met, and they share the same ideologies on them. So Eric grabbed these mutant kids from a previous lover, and then denied ever loving a human woman. Rough. 
The Brotherhood relocated to the Savage Land a few years later, and then Eric started referring to the mutants as an army, which is bad news. He was changing, as were his views on this whole mutant operation. He even started going by the name Magneto, and totally abandoned his human name, and then Xavier was no longer on board. I mean, this is Supervillain 101. Anybody can see a villain in the making, especially if you can read minds. That sure does help. So Magneto made a helmet that prevented that from ever happening. This helmet prevented Psy intrusion into his mind, and it also looked cool. So when Charles took a few loyal followers and made a run for it, Magneto was pretty upset and broke Charles' spine, leaving him in the wheelchair. And finally, number one, we have Miles Morales. He made his first appearance in Ultimate Fallout issue 4, just a couple months before the death of Peter Parker. Now Norman Osborn was arrested and revealed as the Green Goblin, and then a young thief broke into that empty Osborn industry, and then that's where a genetically enhanced spider found its way into the thief's backpack. Now while Miles Morales was visiting his Uncle Aaron, that spider just happened to crawl out of Uncle Aaron's bag, and then it bit Miles Morales. He of course got these amazing abilities, the Spider-Man abilities, but on top of that he could also turn invisible, which is a pretty gig. That plus stun blast makes Miles pretty hard to take down. Now the thing is, what makes him unique is at first Miles didn't really want to be a hero. He wanted to leave that up to the real Spider-Man until his untimely departure, saving his family from Osborn. So Miles got to the scene, but it was too late and too ahead of him. So he felt guilt after this for not being able to save Peter, so he suited up and joined the battle. His first villain was against Kangaroo, and he took him on wearing a Spider-Man Halloween costume, which is a great look. I honestly love Miles. I'm so happy he's in a bigger part of the Spider-Verse that we're currently in, and I'm betting that we meet live-action Miles Morales in the next Spider-Man movie. I think that's the only thing they've managed to keep a secret about that film. I'm calling it now. Guys, who would you cast for a live-action Miles Morales? Let us know in the comments. Number 10, Hulk. Bruce Banner is still the Hulk in this reality, but instead of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and ending up being exposed to gamma radiation, which would transform him into the Hulk against his will, he was a researcher working for S.H.I.E.L.D. and with the Ultimates to try and rediscover the Super Soldier Serum. Yeah, in the Ultimates, much like in the MCU, everything is kind of connected by this one single thread, this one purpose, the Super Soldier Serum. Bruce would believe he had uncovered the serum and decided against S.H.I.E.L.D.'s better judgement to test it on himself. This would turn him into the monster we'd come to know as the Hulk, but only when Bruce was using the serum. He could not change at will, and his transformation was not initially triggered by intense emotions or rage. However, he would then blend the actual super soldier serum formula extracted from the blood of the revived Captain America, Steven Rogers, with the Hulk serum, which would end up resulting in his transformations becoming a permanent aspect of his DNA. Number 9. Elektra While still super heroically fanciful, Elektra's backstory in the 1610 universe is just a touch, a touch more grounded than her 616 counterpart. Instead of her mother being murdered and dying a very violent death, she instead died of breast cancer. Elektra was not made to train in martial arts when she was young, but rather enjoyed martial arts, and so she trained in martial arts out of her own interest, with Bruce Lee acting as an inspiration for her, as a fan of his. She ended up becoming a villain all because of a fellow university student who was a jerk, the wealthy Calvin Langstrom who tormented her at school because she was willing to stand up to him and defend others against him. Because of this, he made Elektra's life a living hell, attacking one of her friends and even hiring thugs to burn down her father's laundromat business as well as her family home. It was because of this that Elektra turned to the dark side. Frustrated that there was no justice for her or any of Langstrom's victims, no matter the crime that he committed due to his wealth and his connections, she ended up attempting to kill him, setting off on a darker path than her fellow friend and vigilante, Daredevil. At one point she's like, Daredevil, you coming with me or are you going to help this Langstrom guy? And he's like, I'm going to help this guy? I was like, dude, just go with Elektra. Elektra's on like a, she's bad, but she's trying to be good, you know what I mean? I don't know, I love bad girls, I'm like, she bad, but she good. And friends, before we move on to the next spot, if you love this list as much as I loved writing it for you, please be sure to show us some love by giving this video a thumbs up. Also give it a thumbs up because I want to tell you more origins. And so if you give it a thumbs up, there's a better chance that'll happen. Number 8, Hawkeye. 
Hawkeye is actually a lot more mysterious in the Ultimate Universe than the version we have from the main continuity comics. It's even been implied before that Clint Barton might not actually be Hawkeye's true name, but even an alias from the name he was given at birth. So mysterious. Instead of being someone who picked up his skills from swordsmen around the carnival circuit, Hawkeye was a former Olympic archer turned black ops agent who worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. The Earth 1610 story from Hawkeye more mirrors his MCU story where he ends up settling down and having a family, but tragically in the Ultimate universe, when the Ultimates are betrayed by fellow member Black Widow, Hawkeye's family is killed and he is kidnapped, tormented and interrogated by Natasha's true allies. Don't worry though, he manages to escape. Thank goodness. With only his fingernails as weapons. That's how you know you're cool if you can just fight with fingernails. I don't think I could ever do that. Although mine are pretty sharp, so maybe. Number seven, Bucky Barnes. As opposed to being the camp's mascot like he was in the golden age of Marvel Comics, Bucky here was a young friend of Steve's who joined him on his journey in the military working as a press photographer. Makes sense. Bucky would not go missing before Steve or actually go missing at all. Instead, it would be Steve who went MIA and was presumed dead and Bucky who had to live with this and move on. Bucky Barnes would not become the Winter Soldier, but instead, would live a relatively normal life, returning home and bonding with Roger's fiance, Gail. In fact, the two grew so close that they ended up in a romantic relationship, and Buck would marry Gail instead. By the time Steve returns from the ice, Barnes is now an old man. I like this reality where like Bucky just gets to grow up and like have a normal life. It's pretty cool. Number six, Black Widow. In the reality of Earth 1610, Black Widow never truly reformed, but instead was a spy and villain the whole time. <gasps> Gasp. It turned out that she was a double agent who was only pretending to serve the interests of the United States. While posing as one of their heroes, she was actually still loyal to Russia and the antagonistic team known as the Liberators, of which she was also secretly a member. Shh, don't tell anyone. Her goal was to destroy the Ultimates, and after winning over their trust and even becoming engaged to Iron Man, she betrayed the Ultimates and turned on them, revealing her true colors. Of course, she may have revealed those true colors a little too soon, as Iron Man easily apprehended her and turned her over to the authorities, but not before she could kill his butler Jarvis in cold blood. R.I.P. Jarvis. Number five, Spider-Man. While Peter Parker's story was not too different from his 616 counterpart, he wouldn't end up being the only Spider-Man in the Earth of 1610. And in fact, Peter would eventually leave the mantle passing it on to someone in his place. Someone new and very different from our Earth 616 Spidey. Yep, we are talking about the beloved Miles Morales. Miles was introduced in the Ultimate Universe and became such a fan favorite that he ended up moving over to Earth 616. Even even after the ultimate line was ended. Miles' backstory was that he was a teenage kid who was bit by a genetically enhanced spider exposed to the Oz formula while he was visiting his criminal uncle Aaron Davis. Miles was your average awkward but lovable hero who happened to be a teenager caught in the middle somewhat of family drama, with his uncle being a criminal and his dad Jefferson drawn into crime alongside his brother Aaron, who ended up working in secret as Fury's eyes and ears in the criminal world but then later decided to leave it all behind and become a police officer instead. Number Number 4. Valkyrie Valkyrie had a very different story than our 616 counterpart. Instead of being an Asgardian inhabiting the body of Barbara Norris, who we know as Brunhilde, she was just Barbara Norris, a 19 year old girl who was basically obsessed with superheroes but who had no powers of her own. She was a big Thor fan and so she kind of decided to imitate his look, dressing up like a scantily clad sort of Norse goddess or warrior. Barbara did have some skills as a martial artist in training but was not nearly as experienced as she claimed to be. She wouldn't receive powers until Loki tricked her and her team, the Defenders, into pledging loyalty to him in exchange for said powers. They did not know that Loki was Loki at the time. Valkyrie's gifted powers would grant her superhuman strength, durability, and would allow her to fly. Number three, Iron Man. Iron Man's initial backstory, which got retconned into just being basically a weird anime show, was a lot different than his 616 counterpart. I know that technically this is no longer canon in terms of his backstory within the 1610 universe, as instead his initial origins was moved over to Earth 55921, but before that happened, before it was retconned away, it was canon in the 1610 universe, and I like to remind everyone of just how gloriously bizarre it was. So here we go. Orson Scott Card was the writer behind the series, a sci-fi writer who you might 
he t recognized the name of as he is the author of many other acclaimed science fiction works such as Ender's Game, which if you are like me, you read Ender's Game in school and you were like, this book's actually pretty good. I don't know if that's what happened to you, but that was my story. I feel like that's actually maybe why I like sci-fi today. That might have been the beginning. Maybe. That and Stargate. The Ultimate Iron Man series, however, ended up being a little too out there for comic book fans in terms of what it offered when it came to shaking up Tony's origins. Shook it up a little too much. Tony here was a child who was altered while in his mother's womb by a lab accident. He ended up being born with neural tissue all over him, which made him extremely sensitive to the world around him, but also made him hyper intelligent. His father Howard would create a liquid suit to protect his son from the world he was so sensitive to, but this suit would have its drawbacks and would also make Tony appear blue. So there you go. <laughs> Number two, Nick Fury. Nick Fury was changed quite a bit in the Ultimate Universe. This is 616 Nick Fury, a former World War II soldier turned super spy whose life was saved by the Infinity Formula. This is 1610 Nick Fury, a former World War II soldier who worked alongside Wilson Fisk's grandfather and Wolverine at the time, but who was taken in by the US military and forcibly experimented on as part of Project Rebirth. In fact, this version of Nick Fury from the Ultimate Universe has an origin story that kind of echoes that of Isaiah Bradley of Earth 616, one of the first super soldiers. In fact, I believe his origins came out only a few years prior to this origins, which was added in sort of later. 2008, we got it for Nick Fury. And I think for Isaiah, we got it like, I want to say 2003? 1610 Nick Fury would be altered by the serum he was given, which of course was the super soldier serum, but he would use his enhanced strength and abilities to help his fellow prisoners escape. This version of Fury was also modeled after Samuel L. Jackson, who would later end up being promised a part in potential future films in order to help make amends after Jackson noticed that Marvel had basically used his likeness in the Ultimate Universe without asking him first. But don't worry, it all worked out. No one got really mad, I don't think about it, so yay. Number one, Black Knight. Dane Whitman has such a random story in the Ultimate Universe. In the main continuity, he is a more medieval feeling hero who fights with an ancient cursed sword that causes him to kind of lose sanity and become more rabid almost each time he uses it. In the Ultimate Universe, he became more machine than man. Originally, he was a man who served in the military but became a quadriplegic after saving his fellow soldiers in battle. He would then become more of a mech with the human mind, but was considered too insane to actually be used for the team that he'd been recruited on, the West Coast Ultimates. As a result, he spent much of his life inside a stasis tube until he was intended to be used as a weapon against the Ultimates during the events of Earth's 1610 Civil War story. Such a random story. What does this have to do with Black Knight at all? From 616, I don't know. Number 10, Black Widow. The Avengers in the Ultimate Universe are different from their main continuity counterparts, as while the Avengers in 616 are a team of bona fide heroes brought together by massive and often global threats, the Avengers of Earth 1610 were brought together by Nick Fury and are often a team composed of former villains and kinda anti heroes, people less marketable generally than 1610's Ultimates, which are like the equivalent to the 616's Avengers. Instead, the Avengers from 1610 end up becoming more comparable to DC. Suicide Squad, a team of reluctant participants who are forced to work together to complete missions for S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury. Monica Chang, however, was not one of the more criminal based members of the team and instead was the new Black Widow. She was given the mantle of Black Widow after the death of Natasha, who it turned out was a traitor to S.H.I.E.L.D., the Ultimates, and the USA. Monica was with the Avengers team from day one, joining them on their first mission to apprehend Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, and locate and put a stop to the Red skull. Monica doesn't have any superpowers, but is a trained agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. She is a skilled spy, combatant, and is experienced with various types of firearms, though typically is known for wielding two pistols. While wearing her Stark suit, she also possessed enhanced strength and speed. However, she was still a normal human, and as such was still able to be killed fairly easily when she went up against the immortal Green Goblin. Poor Monica though, I feel like, I feel like that whole thing kinda did her dirty, because you know, she actually survived for a long time prior to that. 
So it was really weird that she was like, I'm gonna go into this fight and I'm gonna be super unprepared. Hey, then you die. That's what happens. Monica should know that. Number nine, The Punisher. The Punisher in the reality of Earth 1610 was a member of both Nick Fury's Howling Commandos, who fought against the Maker's Dark Ultimates, and a member of Fury's Avengers. The Punisher's powers are basically the same as his Earth 616 counterpart. In other words, he doesn't really have any superpowers. He's mostly just a man who is really skilled in his use of various firearms. He was a trained police officer with the NYPD, so it was lots of tactical training and experience. The first time he joined the Avengers, it was to protect the Vice President against Ghost Rider, but the Spirit of Vengeance convinced Frank to stand down, and even assist him in the end, also helping him to escape. The Punisher would also escape S.H.I.E.L.D. custody following the mission, but would later be recruited once more by Fury after he ended up in prison. And friends. Before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more ultimate lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Also, check out our ultimate Marvel Universe playlist for more videos like this. Number 8, Red Wasp. Red Wasp initially went by the name of Swarm and was a member of the antagonistic Liberators team. She was believed to have been killed in the fight between the Liberators and the Ultimates by the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, who became giant and stepped on Swarm. However, Petra Laskov managed to survive, saved by S.H.I.E.L.D. and put into rehabilitation by them. Rehabilitation. She was made to work for them and join up with their Avengers team. They even placed an obedience chip within her to make sure that she followed orders. Rehabilitation. During her time with S.H.I.E.L.D., Petra would take up the mantle Red Wasp. She can shrink herself down to the size of an insect and can control large swarms of insects as well. However, because of her insect-like abilities, she can also be defeated using insect repellent. So pretty cool powers, but with a pretty big weakness. Number 7, Blade. Blade was recruited to the Avengers by Nick Fury, who promised to deliver him Deacon Frost in exchange for his service. Frost is the man responsible for killing Blade's mother and turning him into the creature that he is, in case you didn't know that. Blade helped to apprehend Tyrone Cash after S.H.I.E.L.D. learned he was responsible for selling off their super soldiers on the black market. Blade incapacitated Cash through hypnosis. Ooh, supernatural powers. However, despite him being part vampire, Blade is not as tough as you'd expect, especially in comparison to the tough version of the character we know from the Earth 616. Iron Man found that out when he basically crushed the poor anti hero. Blade's time serving as part of the Ultimate Avengers may have also helped to get him on the main continuity Avengers team of Earth 616 in the future. I also gotta say, I really love Blade as an addition to the 616 Avengers. I don't know if everybody else is super enjoying that but I'm really enjoying that. Are you enjoying that? I hope you are. Number 6, Hawkeye. But wait a minute, isn't Hawkeye a member of the Ultimates? Well, yes, he has been that too, but hey, he can do both. Hawkeye, despite being more of a bona fide hero, bona fide hero, still had a pretty shady past, which was what made him a great candidate for the Avengers team. Nick Fury invited him to join originally when they went on the hunt for Red Skull and Barton agreed. In fact, I believe Hawkeye actually helped to bring this team together as well. The Avengers team for him was like a black ops group willing to do the dirty work that the Ultimates couldn't be seen getting involved in. Often this meant the villains they went after usually ended up dead. Such was the case with Red Skull in the end. Hawkeye might just seem like a guy with a bow, and well, he is. But he is really, really, really good with that bow. He has enhanced vision, which allows him to see much farther and clearer than your average human, and he is an extremely skilled fighter, pilot, and spy. So, you know. Also, he's deadly with fingernails, so watch yourself if you're just facing him as he is. If he's got fingernails, He's got weapons. Number 5, War Machine. War Machine is James Rhodes, who became a close friend to Iron Man and ended up being gifted a suit of armor from Tony to use in his own heroic adventures. He would end up being recruited and serve on the revived Avengers project as a member of the team during their first mission where they attempted to defeat and capture Red Skull. Rhodey happened to be armed with a nuke to use against the Red Skull as part of a last resort plan, if needed. But the Red Skull had overheard about this plan and said nuke, and so managed to disable it easily using the Cosmic Cube. Honestly, if the Red Skull didn't have the Cosmic Cube though at this time, my money would have definitely been on War Machine in this fight, because War Machine, I think is pretty powerful. War Machine would also for a time gain temporary Hulk-like powers after being given some of Tyrone Cash's Hulk Serum. Number 4, Nerd Hulk. 
While Nerd Hulk is a very powerful character in terms of his abilities, being on the same level of power as Bruce Banner's Hulk from Earth 1610, he tends to end up being not so powerful in actuality when battling other people. This is because he has a tendency to hold back though. Nerd Hulk is a clone that Gregory Stark, Tony Stark's brother, created. Nerd Hulk prefers to try and resolve conflicts using logic as opposed to violence, and it is the marriage of his intellect and strength combined that holds him back from being as deadly as he could be. Still, the potential is there, and he does have access to the same amount of strength and ferocity as Banner if he'd only feel inclined to use it. Nerd Hulk was a member of the Avengers team when they were first resurrected and went after Red Skull. He would also later attempt to join the Ultimates, but he was denied membership. Sad. Poor Nerd Hulk. I love him with his little glasses. Number 3. Gregory Stark Gregory Stark is like the evil brother of Tony Stark. He is the more immoral of the two when it comes to technology, but is more put together overall in comparison to his brother. Much less of a mess, if you will. This obviously made him a valuable asset to S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury, and so he ended up on the Avengers team. However, Gregory was also super smart, and was using his time working with S.H.I.E.L.D. to put certain plans into action that would allow him to take over control and eventually kind of ruled the world, sort of. After Fury seemingly went rogue and Carol Danvers was also removed from the chessboard, Gregory was made the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and attempted to use his influence and nanite tech to cause chaos and war to erupt in other nations. Fortunately, he would be defeated by his brother Tony, who disabled his nanites with an EMP, allowing Thor to take him down. Still, for a time, Gregory was a pretty valuable member of the Avengers team and later a formidable villain to them and to the Ultimates. And for that, he gets some bonus points. That's what I say. Gold Star Gregory Stark. That's what I call him. For evilness, I guess. Number 2. Tyrone Cash Tyrone Cash was a fairly powerful version of the Hulk, and actually was the first Hulk to exist in the Ultimate Universe. He created the Hulk serum before his protege Bruce Banner was able to, and decided to use it on himself. This gave him massive strength, and he took the name Tyrone Cash, and decided to become a criminal, using his brilliant intellect to avoid capture for longer than a decade. Previously, he had been known as the scientist and as Banner's mentor, Professor Leonard Williams. Eventually, Cash was apprehended and forced to join the Avengers team, and after S.H.I.E.L.D. learned that he'd betrayed them, Fury had him executed. So of course, who's the most powerful? Who could it be? Number 1. Nick Fury When it comes to the Avengers team, Nick Fury is like the Amanda Waller of it all, in comparison to the Ultimate Avengers DC counterpart, which would likely be the Suicide Squad. Nick Fury was the one to resurrect Project Avengers, and while he claimed this was done to hunt down the Red Skull, Captain America's villainous son in this reality, it is actually believed that Fury had orchestrated Red Skull's return in order to get his job back as Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and resurrect the old abandoned Avengers project. That's just so Nick Fury, I'm just saying. Nick Fury holds a lot of power not just as a master spy who often deals in secrets, but also because he was exposed to the super soldier serum and has influence over the rest of the Avengers team as their overall leader and organizer. He's just got a lot of power. He's also like got a million plans, so if you're like, oh I know how we'll beat Nick Fury, he probably already has a plan for if you try to do that to him. That's how good he is. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hawkeye. First appearing in Ultimate Issue 7, former Olympic archer Clint Barton is pretty badass in the Ultimates. See, Hawkeye in the MCU has been kind of seen as a joke almost. Jeremy Renner did a Thinking Out Loud parody on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, and he mocks the character for having just a bow and arrow. But in the Ultimates, that's more than Clint needs. Ultimate Hawkeye is no joke. He's one of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. alongside Nick Fury, of course. Now, Clint became an elite agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Black Ops division, where he partnered up with Natasha, aka Black Widow. Most of the team perished when the Chitauri sleeper agents caused some trouble, but then after that point, Hawkeye was just completely reckless. He became more and more violent with his heroic ways. Like, he would pin people to the wall with arrows, which we have not seen in the MCU yet. And yes, that includes Black Widow at one point. He gets Sabretooth right in the eye during a battle, and perhaps one of the craziest Ultimate Hawkeye moments is when he used his own fingernails to take out a group of guys. How insane is that? I always bite my nails, but now I'm gonna save them. I'm gonna save my nails in a pocket, like a weirdo. Number nine, 
Giant Man. Hank Pym made his first appearance in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 14. He was a genius scientist married to Janet Van Dyne who was tasked to work on the Super Soldier Project for S.H.I.E.L.D. Now his other job was defending the planet as Giant Man where he would grow up to 60 feet tall. Humongous, humongous dude. He got this fantastic ability after testing his mutant wife's blood. See Henry is not a pleasant man to work with or be with in any manner so Janet thought joining the Ultimates would maybe help him out. It didn't at all. He was jealous of Captain America and Janet's friendship. So much so that Cap was forced to kick him out of the Ultimates. And yes, a beatdown was in order first. He was a really bad guy. Giant Man though is extremely powerful. He was once able to hold down his own against the Incredible Hulk. But he's ruthless even as Giant Man. He bit off the blob's head at one point. I mean, come on, would you Ozzy Osbourne? Stop that. He was allowed back to the Triskelion, but not as part of an ultimate. He was a shrink for inmates like Norman Osborn, Dr. Octavius, Craven. Just a group of horrible guys, I guess. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be amazing. It's super helpful for us here at the channel. Thank you so much for your constant support. Now let's get right back into this ultimate list of ultimates. Number eight, Thor. Thor Odinson first appeared in Ultimates issue four with his two brothers, Baldur and Loki. They formed the Warriors Three together and Asgard won the Thousand Year War. So far, so good. Now the three brothers participated in a tournament after the war was won, but Loki betrayed the family. Classic Loki. Even killed brother Baldur while he was doing it. Later on, Thor was exiled to Midgard after Loki and his army took down Odin. So while on Earth, Thor believed he was an ordinary human, a psychiatric nurse named Thorleaf Goldman, until around his 30th birthday, he started to have all these mental breakdowns, these visions, these past memories of Asgard seeping into his brain, as we all do when we approach our 30s, of course. Now, eventually his memories and powers came back and Fury recruited him into the Ultimates, but he refused to do any heroic work until the president doubled the foreign aid budget. What an actual hero in real life. There we go. Ultimate Thor is incredibly powerful. He's able to break open War Machine's armor underwater. He smashes the Hulk into the ground, and if his hammer isn't nearby, he'll just punch you into a building instead. That ought to do the trick. He looks a little different in the Ultimate. That's because of his EDI Biomech suit, which is made of the harness and belt, which gave Thorleaf the ability to fly again, this time with super strength. Now the hammer, of course, which has a battery that can ionize the environment, can change up the weather and do all that godly hammer stuff. And a magic belt that protects him from psychic attacks surely helps. Number seven, Wolverine. In at number seven, the Wasp. Janet Van Dyne, we talked about Hank Pym, not so jolly of a guy, so of course we have to explain more of his much nicer partner, Janet. She made her first appearance in the Ultimate Issue 2. She studied at NYU, where she shared a room with Betty Ross, and that's also where she met Hank Pym for the first time. Janet felt a little odd with herself because she herself was a mutant. She didn't tell anybody but Hank. I guess when you're eating bugs and laying insectoid eggs, you're not too eager to show the world. Makes sense. So Janet worked with Hank and Bruce Banner at S.H.I.E.L.D. Super Soldier Research Facility, and Hank got all the credit because it was set up that he created her powers, but he used her mutant DNA secretly on the low. They were first promoted to lead the research development wing at the Ultimates, and Banner was their deputy, and Betty was the communications officer. Now, when it came down to the Liberators invading America, they didn't consider Janet a threat, really, which... Huge mistake right off the bat. She shrunk down to wasp size and freed Captain America from the Triskelion cells. And then Hank Pym decided to help out a little bit. He kind of came through a tiny amount, I'm not giving him that much credit, maybe like 2% of the credit. He gave Janet a giant man serum in case of emergency, and this day for sure qualified as one of those. She was the one who stopped Swarm, and then after the Ultimates decided to become their own unit outside of S.H.I.E.L.D., Janet was appointed team leader. Number six, Quicksilver. This Pietro starts off dark, being the son of Magneto and all. And in his first ultimate appearance, he asks Magneto where Charles is, because in between his next two heartbeats, he'll have been taken care of. Okay, so he's bold, he's fast, and he's also in love with his sister, Wanda Lencher. How nice. Sash creepy. He's a protective brother to say the least. Okay. Pietro and Wanda left the Brotherhood and eventually joined the Ultimates where they helped protect Earth from the Liberators. Now during this battle, he saved Hawkeye's life from another speedster named Hurricane. How did he save him? Oh, in a pretty brutal way. Let's talk about it. Hurricane was talking smack while fighting Hawkeye and then Quicksilver came in and showed Hurricane what Mach 10 speeds really feels like, you know, up close and personal. Number five. Valkyrie. Barbara Norris made her first debut in Ultimates issue two. She has always dreamt of becoming a superhero, as most of us do in this channel, but she lacked the abilities to do so, as most of us also do on this channel. Unless you're a superhero, tell us. She was a huge fan, so she was part of the fanatical Defenders, gaining the alias Valkyrie from her friend because Barbara was a huge fan of Thor, specifically. 
Who isn't? When Gunner Goldman appeared and offered her and the others actual superpowers, she gladly accepted. Only it was Loki in disguise. Gotcha. Valkyrie was killed during the ultimative wave, but her and Captain America's soul was freed from the goddess of death after Thor sacrificed his own soul. How sweet. Valkyrie was upset after this, of course, so she took Thor's hammer and attacked Magneto, even slicing off his right arm in the process. Valkyrie, Carol Danvers, and Zarda were all manipulated by the Enchantress to serve Loki, so the three of them took on all the Ultimates as prisoners. Not good, but luckily, Carol wasn't actually under this spell, so the heroes ended up escaping. Valkyrie did die fighting Loki later on, but her death allowed Thor to return to Earth and continue the fight. Valkyrie was sent to Earth temporarily from Hela to bring Loki down, and then during this trip, she got to see Thor again, where he then promised to value the lives of human beings once again. What a great trip. Number four, Zarda. Zarda, AKA Power Princess. Okay, this Greek goddess has similar origins to Hyperion. She made her first debut in Supreme Power issue two. She kind of loves killing and going on a rampage. It's her thing. The Squadron Supreme invaded the Ultimate Universe after their world was attacked. And afterwards, Zarda decided to remain in the Ultimate Universe until she later returned to her own universe and died within the Squadron Supreme. She's extremely powerful just like Hyperion. They're the same species. They're immune to age, risk, and damage. She easily defeated the Wrecking Crew and the Hulk, and then during Ultimatum, Zarda, Mr. Fantastic, and Doctor Doom went to her own universe to get Nick Fury. He was the key to stopping Magneto, and after he was stopped, Zarda helped the remaining Ultimates and officially joined their ranks eight months later. Lovely. Zarda's powers include super strength, superhuman durability, flight, and like I said, with her early days, including Hyperion, she has the ability to heal all wounds. And if she doesn't feel like doing that, she can also drain you of your life energy in order to power up herself. So, we'll flip a coin. Number three, the Invisible Woman. Susan Storm made her first appearance in Ultimate Fantastic Four issue one. She's the oldest child of Dr. Franklin Storm, and she inherited the brains to prove it. From her early days, she's been working at the Baxter Building, and at age eight, she built a sugar-powered rocket that accidentally destroyed her father's favorite car. Oops. So after that, she decided to put all her energy and focus into inner space biology, where she earned four doctorates in biochem sciences. Now, during an experiment with her partner slash lover in the end zone, the dimensional teleporter, she got these incredible abilities alongside those other three fantastic folks. She can create powerful force fields and make herself and her clothing invisible to all wavelengths of light. Any guesses on who the MCU will cast as Marvel's first family? Let us know in the comments down below. Love hearing those thoughts. And in at number two, Iron Man. Antonio Tony Stark, okay, he made his first ultimate appearance in Ultimate Marvel Team Up issue four. He was of course born a genius, but he wasn't born an only child. He had a twin named Gregory Stark. Now at first, Tony wanted to build his own empire rather than, you know, follow in his father's footsteps, his father Howard. Now he created a company called JT Technologies. The T stood for Tony and the J stood for his girlfriend at the time, Josie Gardner. When Tony reluctantly joined his father's company after years and years of pressure, Josie left Tony. She was like, listen, I can't do it. Go and do your thing, follow your dad's footsteps. We had a dream, now the dream's crushed. So not too later, she was killed in a plane crash, no thanks to Mandarin International, which was one of the companies Howard Stark used to do business with. So Tony put his money where his mouth was, and the first thing he created was a nanotech armored suit. And after Howard Stark's death, he took over Stark Industries officially. Tony joined the Ultimates in Ultimates Issue 2. He became friends with Thor. He helped Banner with his Hulk Green situation, and then he saved Earth from the Chitari, and then dated and later proposed to Natasha Romanova, AKA the Black Widow. What a life. Ultimate Tony is super powerful as well. His mind was exposed to an infinity stone, so now Tony's neural network was able to connect to electronic systems. So you better check that recently deleted folder before getting a coffee with Ultimate Tony. Number one, Scarlet Witch. Wanda Lensher, the Scarlet Witch. Okay, she was the daughter of Magneto and sister slash lover of Quicksilver. What a weird family. She began her team days on the side of evil. She was a passive member of Magneto's brotherhood, and after his apparent death, the team started to rescue X-Men from Weapon X. We love a change of heart. Now she led them for a little while, but at the same time she was making sure things were cool with Charles Xavier. She wanted to keep the peace between the both sides. That's nice. But when Magneto did return, her and her brother slash lover ran for it. Because they were mutants, they were initially part of the Black Ops team for the Ultimates. Wanda died like three times in the Ultimates, I swear. An Ultron unit killed her with a specific bullet directed to her DNA, and then later she returned, but it turned out that she was just Quicksilver's imagination and she was still dead. But then she returned another time to tell Pietro to go to Egypt to find Magneto, but she wasn't actually real as Mr. Sinister in Apocalypse later revealed that she was just an illusion. 
Nothing can keep this witch down. Now when it comes to powers, Wanda is packing the heat. Probability manipulation and magic make her Black Ops days pretty smooth. Number 10, Maximus the Mad. I just like the look of Maximus the Mad here. We don't get to see too much of him or the other Inhumans, but what I like about him and them is kind of just that. They're more alluring when they're kept mysterious. Maximus, in case you didn't know, is the brother to Black Bolt. In the Earth 616 universe, he is known as Maximus the Mad, as I believe he's also known here. He is often depicted as such in terms of his appearance in the 616 continuity, and is also made to look somewhat more flamboyant in comparison to his Earth 1610, his Ultimate Universe counterpart. I do love that Maximus just looks like a normal dude in the Ultimate Universe, because also I just feel like just because you're mad doesn't mean you look different. You know what I mean? You just look normal. I think that actually makes him more frightening to me as well, that he just looks so normal, so average. Especially among the rest of the Inhumans, who all look pretty freaky, stand out, and honestly somewhat monstrous here. This more bleak take on the whole group in the Ultimate Universe makes me want to see a film version of them that was more of like a supernatural horror. Especially considering they consider Adelan to actually be like a heaven here, yet it's so, so dark. I believe based on this depiction, there could be promise in something like a supernatural horror film version of them. Number 9, Gregor. Gregory Stark. Sorry Arno, move over, Gregory is here. I like Arno Stark, okay, but Gregory was a pretty cool villain to have, and he wasn't the secret brother of Iron Man either. Gregory is actually not just known, he is often more well liked than Tony is in the Ultimate Universe, at least initially. Tony is seen as being a bit of a loose cannon in comparison to his older twin brother you see, who constantly has things way more together and is also super wicked smart. But that also works well for Gregory's character as he also turns out to be, you guessed it, a bad guy. Of course, no one can be that good. We should have known. Gregory manipulated S.H.I.E.L.D. in order to get full control of it, and when all the pieces were in play, basically attempted to take over the world. He had to be taken out by Tony Stark, but in a much more permanent way than Tony when he dealt with Arno in the Earth 616 reality. Tony, in part, actually helped to kill his brother. He used an EMP to disrupt his nanites, which made Gregory critically vulnerable to an attack from Thor. Ouch. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving in this list, be sure to head on over to Facebook to show us some love, where you can give us a follow, a like, and check out all the cool content we have over there. Number 8, Crystal. I really love the original Crystal, especially in terms of her appearance, but I also do love the super rebellious vibes we get from Earth 1610 Ultimate Crystal in this narrative. Here Crystal is still the little sister of Medusa, but this group of Inhumans, Medusa included, are even less likely to mingle with humans. They simply want to live a completely separate and simple life which bothers Crystal, who it seems is searching for something more, something outside of her own family. Acting out, she runs away from her people, not eager to play the loyal member of the royal court, and not fond of her fiance, Black Bolt's brother, Maximus the Mad. Yeah, they're engaged in this reality. She runs into the Fantastic Four, and in so doing kind of reveals to them the secret location of Adelan as they pursue her after she is retrieved by her people. Crystal ends up deciding to stay with the Inhumans, too, despite her unhappiness, which I also think is an interesting choice, and it gets me wanting to know more about both Crystal and the Inhumans in this universe. Cause like the Fantastic Four were also just like, you come chill with us, but she's like, nah, this is how it's gotta be, even though I definitely was not super here for this, but I still gotta stick with my fam. Number 7, Nick Fury. The Nick Fury of the Ultimate Universe, Earth 1610 isn't perfect. In fact, he can kind of seem like he's being a butt a lot of the time, but in reality, it's just that Nick Fury often doesn't trust people. He keeps his plans and reasons behind them close to his chest, and while you might not understand them and therefore think he's callous, he's often just trying to make the hard call. Nick Fury has some flaws, I'll grant you, especially if we're talking about his relationship with his ex-wife and everything that apparently went wrong there, but this version of the character would become so beloved that he actually go on to inspire an Earth 616 counterpart in Nick Fury Jr., and of course would inspire the version of the character we saw up on the big screen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where he was portrayed by the one and only Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson, in fact, also served as inspiration for the 1610 counterpart in the comics when it came to his appearance. And Mr. Jackson was actually the character's first pick 
of course, when asked in canon who would be best to portray him in a film. Number 6, Black Bolt. Black Bolt is already menacing over on Earth 616, at least I would say in modern comics he is, but on Earth 1610 he is really menacing. We see Black Bolt for an even shorter time than Crystal, but honestly it only adds to the mystery of the character, making him appear more intimidating. The colors by Jun Chung during his appearance in Ultimate Fantastic Four Annual Issue Number 1 really help the character to pop as well, and the pencils by Jay Lee also add to the presence of his appearance. He might not say much, but he really doesn't need to here. This is a very muscular, dark, and yet blindingly bright Black Bolt with the white lines of his costume reminding me of lightning. Black Bolt simply appears basically to destroy Adelan so they might find a new secret home, as their current one in the Himalayas has been revealed to the FF and you know, it's supposed to be secret. Aside from that, he also communicates how disappointed he is in Crystal. Honestly, I would not want this Black Bolt to be disappointed in me, I would be like walking on eggshells with him if he was like, I'm slightly disappointed in you Amanda, or you know, just stared at me and looked disappointed because he couldn't really say that. He can only shout, well he does shout to destroy Adelan basically that he's disappointed, so there you go. Even the rebellious Crystal seems to be affected by Black Bolt's guilt tripping though, agreeing to remain with her people despite being offered a place among the humans and the Fantastic Four. I mean he doesn't even shout to destroy Adelan, what am I saying? He like just says a word, that's also how powerful this version of him is. He's like, I'll just say a word. Crystal, your disappointment, and then it all just wipes away. <laughs> Number five, Medusa. Honestly, I would say pretty much all of the Inhumans at this point of the Ultimate Universe are the coolest versions around, hence why I have so many of them on this list, or at least, you know, one of the coolest versions of the Inhumans around. I would say the coolest though. I think they are the coolest. Medusa is no exception, possibly having my most favorite redesign when it comes to her character. The Medusa of Earth 1610 is still Black Bolt's queen, but seems to have been named for her familiarity and appearance to the Gorgon of Mythos. Medusa. This version of Medusa has snakes for hair. She also happens to be steadfastly loyal to her people. As I said before, we don't get to see too much of the Inhumans, but we do know that Medusa believes the Inhumans are basically superior to humans and that distance should be maintained between their race and the humans in order to basically preserve their own culture and their own abilities. Medusa also expresses here that she has come to love her husband and accept him for who he is, despite the fact that he can never really show his love for her, at least not vocally. Which apparently is like a really big thorn in her side because she seems to be very upset about it. She's like, Crystal, get over the fact that you don't want to hang out with us. Like, Black Bolt can't even talk to me, okay? <laughs> if I can deal with that, you can deal with Maximus, okay? Let's just figure it out. Number four, Hawkeye. Hawkeye actually has to be one of the coolest heroes in these comics. And no, I am not joking. The way they revamped this character was so impactful that the version of the character was a major influence on their MCU counterpart. When it came time to pen down what that Hawkeye would be like. Clint Barton in the comics is known for being a hot mess typically, but in the Ultimate Universe he was much more secretive, but also had a family. Tragically, his family ends up being found and killed in the process of enemies trying to hunt him down. When he is captured and severely mistreated by said captors, what does he do? He doesn't hang his head, he doesn't give up, he escapes using his fingernails, his freaking fingernails as weapons. It doesn't get more bad than that. This Hawkeye does not even need arrows to be a deadly threat. I don't often get to hype Hawkeye here on Top 10 Nerd, so I just want to say thank you Ultimate Universe for giving me an opportunity to do so because I do like Clint Barton, but we don't often get to put him at the top of these lists or near the top, so yay. Number three, Miles Morales. I know this is kind of a hot take when it comes to Spider-Man. I know there's some people in the comments who are gonna be like, I think Peter Parker is the best version. And that's fine, that's fair enough. But I really love Miles Morales in this role. Now, we do also have a Peter Parker in the Ultimate Universe of 1610, but he doesn't really do much to stand out for me in comparison to his main continuity counterpart. And don't get me wrong, I do love Peter Parker, but Miles is kind of like a breath of fresh air in some ways in comparison to the age old hero. Why? Well, Peter has a tendency to be like really, really hard on himself. And aside from that, he's surrounded by tragedy at times. Honestly, there are runs where it feels like every time Peter like turns a corner, a new tragedy might just be like awaiting him around that corner. Miles actually has a family still living, and while while he did lose his mom in the Ultimate Universe, it never really felt like a constant 
unresolved loss, like the death of Peter's uncle Ben or his first love Gwen Stacy on Earth 616. And Rio, Miles' mom, is actually back now that the 1610 Miles has been permanently displaced, taking up residence in the 616 reality, and his family obviously is there with him. Miles also just has super cool powers. On top of much of what Peter has going on, Miles can also camouflage himself and he has venom blast powers, so gotta give it to him. Sorry. Number 2, Gwen Stacy. Gwen Stacy is such an underrated character in the Marvel Ultimate Universe. On the Earth of 616, Gwen is, well, she's she dead. Or she's probably dead. She might be showing up again soon, apparently, but it's probably a clone or like a trick or something. I don't believe it's the original the original Gwen Stacy. She's been dead and gone for many years. I don't think she's ever really gonna come back. In the Ultimate Universe, Gwen also kinda dies, but also kinda doesn't. She's killed by Carnage, not an alien symbiote, but kind of a lab-made one in this reality. And in essence, her consciousness becomes merged with it, meaning that Carnage becomes Gwen, and Gwen becomes Carnage. So yeah, as freaky as that sounds, in the Ultimate Reality, Gwen Stacy lives on as Carnage. It's freaky, and it's cool. Well, you might think this is the same as a clone Gwen in the 616 universe, eh, it's not really. Because one, she has the power of Carnage, and two, she is an 100% exact biological duplicate who also possesses Gwen's mind up to the point of her death, which you know, not all Gwen clones in 616 have, allowing Gwen to continue to grow and develop as she would have as a human, but simply with superpowers. Well, she only has superpowers for a bit, sadly. She has them until Eddie Brock's venom assimilates Carnage, leaving her devoid of the symbiote and her powers going forward. I kind of wish she had stayed as Carnage, but it's fine. <laughs> when she was Carnage, though, I think that was super cool. Even though I know it was freaking her out, I thought she could have maybe become the new Carnage. That would have been neat. Number one, The Maker. The Maker is the alternate version of Reed Richards. I actually have always felt that Richards might make a better villain than a hero, and The Maker seems to have been this thought made manifest. Living proof. Well, you know, fictional living proof. The Maker initially started out as a hero, leader of the team known as the Fantastic Four. However, in the Ultimate Universe, his and Sue's future of marital bliss was not as much guaranteed. And in fact, after the tragedy of Ultimatum and Sue Storm turning down his marriage proposal, Richards got a different perspective on life, which inevitably turned him into a villain. In this universe, Reed had a rough childhood, and part of where his villainy started was in turning on his family, a family that had mistreated him as he saw it for years. Yeah, in this reality, Reed commits patricide and matricide to get back at his parents, very counter to his Earth 616 alternate. And that version's relationship with his family, which much better than this one. 